This week on Arizona Illustrated, monsoon mushrooms on the mountain. Mount Lemmon is the densest mushroom population after the monsoons of any place in the world. Tucson street names, how did they get them? Streets are kind of like memorials to people and things that existed in the past. A universe of images. I show people how they can use the equipment that they have to take pictures of the night sky. And from the vault, Hughes Missile Systems. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. The annual monsoon brings much needed rain to Arizona, breathing life into the desert, cooling the summer heat, restoring flora and fauna. The rain is also welcome on Mount Lemmon near Tucson, where it helps to spawn one of the most prolific and diverse fungi populations in the world. We went up to the mountain to discover these delicate life forms for ourselves. Here we are on the top of Mount Lemmon, and any day that, even if we weren't to find one single mushroom, any time you've spent a day in the woods, you've already won. My name is Julia Bishop Beauty, and I was a reporter for 25 years down here in, uh, at the border. And now my major passion is mushrooming. I've joined a group and we hold mushroom growing classes and have we have found, mushroom hunts. We look for mushroom treasure, right? Which is what we're doing right. here so, today. But what if I open it? It's still brown all the way through. Exactly, it's just incredible. You're out here in the forest and you're suddenly seeing bright oranges, bright reds, blues, whites, purples, any color, bright yellow. Um, so it's, it's something really amazing. And the fact that it only pops up at a short time of the year and uh, disappears again. It's just a really magical thing to be the person that captured it in that small time that it was there. My name is Niles Bauer, and I run the Mushroom Club here in Tucson. We are in Mount Lemmon in Tucson, Arizona, because this is probably the densest mushroom population after the monsoons of any place in the world, or of any known place in the world. Because we have the monsoons, and because the monsoons are finite and, and fairly short, the mushrooms have to emerge during the monsoon or soon afterwards. Hey, my name is Denver and I'm a mushroom hunter. I just really have a hobby and enjoyment to come out here into the mountains during the rainy season and find all the delicious medicinal edible mushrooms that I can. I would say solidly I've been doing it for about four to five years and it started as chance as I got a book for Christmas that was a mushroom ID guide. Um, so it kind of started there but it really the passion was ignited when I came up here to Mount Lemmon and found Ganoderma conchs, big beautiful red mushrooms growing on the trees and that just really started a passion for me to come up here and see what else I could find year after year. Anytime you say the word mushroom, all you hear people talk, oh trippy mushrooms, this and that, but it's really a, a sad state of affairs because uh, most Americans, most Westerners don't have a relationship with mushrooms and whereas most other countries do, uh, most any other countries, you know, they really love mushroom hunting, they love gourmet mushrooms. And in America, unfortunately, we only know of two or three varieties really when there's thousands and thousands of varieties that could be being enjoyed. You just gotta get out there and find them, start cultivating them. So over here, you see some uh, nice polypores. Not positive on the idea of them, probably not hard to figure out what they are. 
But uh, these are very common up here on Mount Lemmon. You'll find them all over the place from probably 6,500 feet on up. This is the shaggy mane mushroom. It's a choice edible mushroom. And one of the nice things about it is it doesn't have a lot of lookalikes. So when you're going along, you can find it, you can identify it, and you know you found mushroom treasure because it's delicious. Your day has just paid off. One of the best known and safest of all wild mushrooms. The flavor is very delicate, but the texture is marvelous. Not slimy as an okra, but succulent as an octopus. I actually don't like eating mushrooms, <laughs> but I'm just fascinated by the legitimate science behind them. My background is in engineering, but I've never pursued that. I always went for my passion, I guess. Mushrooms are essential to a forest. They're essential to any ecosystem itself. And if you look over there, you can see mushrooms going on the side of this dead log. What they're doing is recycling the nutrients from the tree itself back into the system so you can get uptake into living organisms. Plants, animals, fungi itself gets, gets reused and recycled by fungi. Without that, this whole system would just break down. Everything would just fall apart. I don't think we choose who we fall in love with, right? And I didn't really choose to fall in love with mushrooms. You know, they, they appeared, it happened, I fell in love. And then after that, I can identify logical reasons, what like, such as, you know, they have incredibly huge medicinal properties, or they have chemical warfare between each other and make little chemicals, or they support all life on the planet, right? So I can use all these logical reasons, but basically I just fell in love. It just really depends what mushrooms you're looking for. Some mushrooms you're going to be looking up in the trees, some mushrooms you're going to be looking on the ground, some are going to be looking on stumps. So if you know what you're looking for, you know specific areas to check. I personally am looking for anything and everything, so I'm looking e everywhere. <laughs> There's something about being outside and being engaged in nature, and this is, allows you to do it without any effort. If you've got a passion for plants and you go out into nature to identify plants or to look for plants or go birding or you're engaged in it and there's no effort. And the same goes for mushroom collecting and mushroom ID. I could study them for the rest of my life and not learn everything there is to know about mushrooms. They continually surprise and delight me. Some mushrooms are poisonous and should not be consumed. The experts warn it is imperative that you become familiar with the mushrooms in your region before harvesting and consuming any of them. Turn to experienced people, professional books, and reliable internet resources to learn more. Street names certainly help us find our way around, but they're also a way to honor people or events from our past. In this latest of our occasional series on names, we get street smart with Arizona Daily Star columnist David Layton. He shares the history behind some of Tucson's most recognizable street names they aren't always what you'd expect. Well, streets need names so we can be able to find things, so we can actually locate things. But streets also have kind of a, a dual meaning. They also honor people and things. They tell about our history. So in a sense, they're kind of like memorials to people and things that existed in the past. Do you know where the name Speedway came from? No, actually, I don't think I do. Because it's a drag strip? People would uh, race up and down that street. Late 70s, early 80s in high school, that was a place where people would go racing, speed racing. So I believe that's where it, it got its name, Speedway. Well, surprisingly, Speedway Boulevard, which most people think comes from the fact that people used to race cars there, which they did, actually derives its name from the Harlem River Speedway. A guy named George Kitt, who had just returned from New York City and who had attended a race, suggested the name Speedway because at that point, people were racing horses down that alignment. You gotta remember that Speedway Boulevard was very far 
from the center of town. The center of town at that point was downtown, so it was a pretty safe place to race horses. Ah, so it was a speed racing place, it just wasn't for cars. I wasn't there for the horse racing. <laughs> Tucson's got a great history, and I fell in love with history growing up here in Tucson. And I was always curious about, you know, who these streets were named after. So I, you know, I took this up many years ago and uh, wrote for the Arizona Daily Star in my Street Smarts column. Grant Road, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure. Probably the guy from the general. I'd guess some fool named it after President Grant, but I don't know. You know, that's a common misconception by many Tucsonans is that Grant Road is named for Ulysses S. Grant, the famous Union General. But in fact, it's named for a local homesteader who worked for the Southern Pacific Railroad for many years. If you look to the north, this was the property or the homestead of John Breck Ranch, about 80 acres, which was sometimes referred to as Grant Ranch. One of the things that I learned from his grandchildren is that he was a very hard worker. He was very dedicated to the Southern Pacific Railroad. I mean, he actually worked there from the late 1890s up until 1930. Tucson was at one point the northernmost point of the Spanish Empire, founded in the 1770s. Originally, all the streets in Tucson were in Spanish. There were streets like Calle de la Alegría, or Happiness Street, which is now Congress Street, or Calle del Arroyo, which is now Pennington Street. During the early 1870s, they surveyed and renamed the streets, but at that point, all the street names switched over to English. Kennedy? Well, everybody would assume President Kennedy. Uh, the president? Well, that would be the president, I hope. No! Oh, my! Streets like Cushing and Simpson and Kennedy are all named after citizens of Tucson that were killed by Apaches as well as Jackson Street. Pennington Street, which was named for the Pennington family. Many of the family members, including the father and many of her brothers, were killed by Apaches. Stone Avenue is named for John F. Stone, who was a prominent Tucson citizen. He owned the Apache Pass Mining Company, and he was the first person to build a home on a dirt path that became Stone Avenue, named for him after his death. Park, I'm not sure, Park Avenue, Monopoly. <laughs> Park. Nope, I don't. Well, there must have been a park nearby. I'm going to guess that there's a park near there. Well, what makes Park Avenue in Tucson unique is because it actually drives its name from the Union Park racetrack. So in 1893, a group of Tucsonans uh, came together to create a field or a track for people to play baseball games at, uh, do horse race tracking and bicycle racing as well. Um, so if you look behind me, that's where most of the Union Park racetrack was located. There was also gun shoots and skeet shoots in the area as well. So the park was in existence from about uh, 1893 to about 1908. Even though it was for a short period, it was a very prestigious place to go to. And it was a very important part of Tucson life at that point. What about Broadway? Well, that's kind of a city common street name. I don't know that it had an, what the origin. Broadway, I believe, is maybe because of the movies? Just a wild guess? The street we now call Broadway Boulevard was originally called Camp Street. It was named in the early 1870s, and it was named for Camp Lowell. Fred Ronstadt, the patriarch of the rather large Ronstadt family in Tucson, had a wagon shop and hardware store uh, located on present day Scott Avenue and the old Camp Street. A hardware salesman who came in from New York City came to Tucson to sell Fred Ronstadt some hardware supplies. Tucson, of course, at that point was all dirt roads. It was mostly adobe and they were looking at this little sun-baked 
town. And the uh, New York salesperson told Fred Ronsett, what you need here is some of the hustle and bustle of New York City. Now, a few months later, that same salesman returned with a borrowed sign, as they say. Mr. Ronstadt thought it was a great idea and he posted it on his wagon shop. And by about the early 1900s, people started calling it Broadway. So it is actually named for the Broadway Boulevard in New York City based on a sign that was borrowed from New York City. As we continue our new season, let me take this opportunity to thank you, our viewers and supporters, for watching Arizona Illustrated on PBS. It is our privilege to bring you stories of interest from across Arizona. And I'm also proud to announce that Arizona Public Media has been recognized with 34 individual Emmy nominations for 17 projects and 14 categories. The regional winners will be announced on Saturday, September 22nd in Phoenix. Now we bring you one of our Emmy-nominated stories from Arizona Illustrated producers Tony Paniagua and Sandra Westall, A Universe of Images. There's a connection to the night sky that those city dwellers don't really appreciate, and it's hard to describe. Back when I was like six years old, early 1950s, my older brother Paul took me out in the backyard and showed me the night sky. That's where I fell in love with astronomy. I'm Mike Wiesner. I live in Oracle, Arizona. I'm an amateur astronomer and have been for many, many decades. And I certainly enjoy the opportunities to participate in the things in the night sky. This is my man cave. Um, a lot of astronomy books are in here. You'll see lots of various pictures and other space-related paraphernalia in here, as well as some of my flying stuff from when I was flying in the Air Force. Well, I was a teenager back in southern Indiana. Uh, my mother gave me a telescope for Christmas in 61, and pretty quickly I decided I wanted to take pictures of this telescope. So I used her little roll film cameras and mounted it up on the telescope and started taking pictures of the moon uh, and what I could of some planets and things with that simple little telescope. So it's been my passion for a long, 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 long time. <laughs> From a dark sky location like Oracle, you can actually see quite a bit of detail just by looking up with your eye. This photograph is one of the ones I like to do. Here's my telescope, obviously, but the telescope is actually looking at the moon. And the moon's image is being projected out of its eyepiece onto the dome of the observatory. I have fun taking these kinds of pictures. I document things that I see in the telescope for Several reasons. Primary is because I want to share that with people and let them see kinds of the types of things they could see if they were to look through a telescope, theirs or mine. Um, but I also want to share the fact that they can also do those kinds of pictures. So the fact that I'm doing it with very basic equipment should let them know that they can do the same thing. What star in the sky is brighter than Sirius? But there aren't any. Not visually. Well, okay. But I teach this course, Beginner Digital Astrophotography, out at the park. And I show people how they can use the equipment that they have to take pictures of the night sky, whether it's with their digital camera or with their smartphones. Oh, yeah, now I see it. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. It's a little, it's a little moon. Yeah. I didn't realize how many things there were up in the sky till I got down here, because up in Oregon, unless we're over in the desert in eastern Oregon, you can't really see things. But here you can see the Milky Way. I used to see that when I was a kid. I haven't seen it for decades. By the early 2000s, I'd made the switch totally over to using digital cameras of various models. But I'm also using an iPhone 
for a lot of my astrophotography. So if you have a smartphone, you can do some of these same kinds of pictures. You can actually mount this on a tripod by taking this piece off. And so this little piece right here up, up would mount on a tripod, kind of like that. Yeah. The camera of the iPhone sees what your eye would see if you were looking through the telescope with just your eye. So you're taking a picture of what you would see. The objects in the night sky are beautiful to look at. Uh, and being able to capture pictures and show those to your friends and say, hey, I took this picture is kind of neat. So I want people in the audience and people out in the community to be able to have that same kind of joy that I've got. If it's clear, I am usually in the observatory. Day and night. I, I do stuff in the, with the sun in the daytime occasionally. I may be out here for 20 minutes or eight hours, depending upon the weather. And tonight we have some clouds, so I'm not going to be out here for very long. We have a nice little crescent phase of Venus tonight. Getting this word out about our dark skies in this area and in other places around the world, uh, it's important because people need to step back from their daily lives and go out and experience this night sky culture that's been part of the human existence for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Like what you see on Arizona Illustrated? Visit our webpage at azpm.org to watch and share stories from this episode and previous episodes. And like us on Facebook, where you can watch stories, comment, and share your own story ideas. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram, where we share photos and links about our work and what's happening in our community. The mysterious and eccentric American billionaire, pilot, and philanthropist Howard Hughes made his mark in many fields of interest, including Southern Arizona's aviation and defense industry, bringing Hughes aircraft to the old Pueblo. Here's a look back at 1989 from the vault. The Hughes, for which the Hughes Aircraft Company is named, is, of course, Howard Hughes, an aviation pioneer who created racing planes, produced movies like Hell's Angels using real planes, and, of course, was responsible for the Spruce Goose, the huge transport plane made largely of wood to save strategic war materials. It flew only one time in 1947 and is now a museum. Tucson realtor and developer Roy Drachman led the fight to bring Hughes Aircraft to Tucson, negotiating not with Howard Hughes himself, but with executives who carried on his tradition of secrecy. Up at the airport and went up to the hotel and we were talking and all of a sudden he, he shut everybody and said, wait a minute, he said, is this, is this room secure? I said, well, I think it's secure. It's not going to fall off the building. Well, he was talking about the security of, a, of the... Uh, of the possibility of somebody listening in. So they immediately went behind the drapes and under the beds and up in the chandeliers. And uh, then he said, uh, we'd spread our stuff on the bed and we're looking at the maps and things. And he said, well, let's all pick up our stuff. We'll go to the back of a restaurant someplace. And we did. And Hughes workers started with the production of the world's first air-to-air radar-guided weapon, the Falcon missile. Over the years, many others would follow, the Phoenix and the tow missiles, the Maverick missile family, AMRAAM, the advanced medium-range air-to-air missile. In 1986, Hughes was purchased by General Motors for $5 billion. That year, employment would hit an all-time high, 9,000 workers. But that was then, and this is now. With the Cold War over, Hughes finds itself in a difficult situation. The U.S. defense budget is shrinking, and competition is increasing for the defense contracts that are awarded. Hughes finds itself looking seriously at diversification. So we build computers and trackers primarily. That's where the bulk of our expertise is. And wherever we can use that kind of expertise, uh, we're looking. The new projects will take some time to get online. In the meantime, four of the six missiles now made at Hughes will be discontinued in 1992. At that time, the current workforce of about 5,000 will be cut. 
If we keep people employed when we don't have real work, then that reduces our ability to be competitive. Downsize may be the key word for Hughes Aircraft in the 1990s, but for those who worked to bring the company here in the 1950s, Hughes has been and still is an important part of Tucson's economy. Tucson's a better place for, the, for Hughes having come here and brought the kind of people that they did. And as far as into the future, uh, uh, the company is now owned by General Motors, and they're certainly a wide awake company with <laughs> a great past and a great future and I'm sure that they're going to, they've got a big investment here and I'm sure they're going to find products and ways of keeping this operation going. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. Next week, when Sarah runs. Suffering is sometimes what leads to the greatest highs in running. The only time I really feel that runner's high is when I'm running super hard. And usually when I'm running easy, sometimes like I'll get bored or you know things will be kind of achy, but I don't really get that rush of endorphins. Rollies, a taste of Tucson tacos. People didn't see my vision here until I opened up. People are, you got a donkey? Nothing's making sense. I'll go, just wait till I open and you'll see. And the day I open, everybody's like, oh, now we see. Now we know that you're not crazy. Because everyone knows I am crazy. The lowland leopard frog. It may just be a frog, but that frog's still important. And um, it's going to affect other things that you might not be aware of. Not only are the frogs suffering, but when they're suffering, the whole ecosystem is suffering. Like most amphibians, they're very sensitive to air pollution, water pollution, environmental change. Um, and for the National Park Service, this is what we do. Our job is to protect these native species. And the sounds of June West. On the mountain, where quality love flows free and easy. From a fountain. I'm Tom McNamara. See you next week.